uh, what's going on in Android talk. Um, some of this stuff you may have seen in an earlier version because we did talk about the state of Android at preview, which was a preview of the Lollipop release, which is now released. So we'll be giving updated information on stuff that has changed or new stuff uh, available in Lollipop as well as a deeper dive into some aspects of the Lollipop release and the various platforms that we offer. Um, and we have a lot of slides to cover, so we'll be going pretty quickly. Yeah, I think, uh, yes, we can both be heard now, so it's a good place to start. So we, uh, we've already been introduced. Uh, this is Chet, I'm Rado. Uh, we've been working on Android for a Just to be clear, bunch of years. so I'm Chet, and that is Rado. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and uh, as you can see, we're very passionate about Android. That's how passionate we are. Not passionate enough that Chet would actually wear the outfit today, but uh, we're pretty passionate nonetheless. Now, the most exciting thing to happen to Android lately is, of course, the release of Android 5.0, Lollipop. Um, we're going to talk a lot about Lollipop. Most of the slides we have today are about the new features and APIs available in the platform. But before we get started with that, I wanted to talk a little bit about where we've come from. Uh, now, my first Android device was one of these. Uh, anyone else have uh, one of the G ones? Yeah, that's the right kind of crowd. And you stuck with it. Well done. Yeah. Might be time to upgrade. Maybe. Uh, in the past six years, the Android device family has grown incredibly quickly and with a huge variety of new device types and form factors. Uh, now, I'm sure you're already familiar with the range of Android Wear devices, some of which you can see here. And just a few weeks ago, we released the latest additions to the Android device family, uh, which included the Nexus 6 with a 6-inch quad HD display, dual front-facing speakers, and a quad-core 2.7 gigahertz Snapdragon processor. I should probably localize. He's speaking Australian. What he meant to say was HD, uh, just so, so we understand. I'll translate on this side of the stage for all of the Americans in the audience. This is handy. I should have been doing this for years. All right. I may, which, is it Z or Z? I can never we'll figure it out. Same time, Nexus 9 tablet, 8.9-inch uh, display, boom sound speaker, 64-bit processor, and of course, the Nexus player, the very first of the Android TV devices. Uh, how many of you guys were all thinking of getting pre-ordering or getting one of uh, one or more of the previous devices? Yeah, got a handful. All the They're people with the G1s are looking to upgrade. Yeah. It's a good opportunity. Uh, now, we've come a long way in a short time, and it's not just with the hardware. Um, since the first Android release, there has been six new major Android platform releases, culminating in the latest release of Lollipop. And at the same time, the Android ecosystem has grown just as rapidly, if not more so. Uh, and in fact, when we first launched Android Market, we uh, were very proud of the 50 apps that were available in the store at the time. Uh, and of course, these days, we've got millions of apps all available. We can, we can look through this uh, in terms of some specific numbers as well. And I think you're going to talk us through this. Sure. Um, so some of the numbers we're talking about, so yeah, Google Play, when it started out, um, only 50 seemed like enough at the time. I mean, how many different Note apps do you really need? Um, so as of the, the, some of these numbers are a bit dated, but over a year ago, we had over a million apps available on the Play Store, not bad. Um, over 50 billion apps were downloaded uh, a year and a half ago. Um, by my extremely good calculations, that means everybody on the planet has five. Uh, again, how many note-taking apps do you need? Probably five. five yeah. uh, and devices, so some other numbers, a bit dated, of course. Uh, a year and a half ago, 1.5 million activations daily. This is new devices that are actually uh, being turned on every single day, resulting in um, recently over a billion active uh, users on the planet. Um, I find numbers like this a little bit hard to understand, so it's useful to sort of put it into quantitative um, graphical data to get your mind around it. So if we look at the following chart, we can see that at the beginning of 2008, um, we were down uh, right at zero. Right at, it's a little hard to see with, uh, with the, the breakdown of the graph, but right at zero. And then in 2014, we have one uh, billion. So everybody, everybody got that? Taking notes on some of your note apps? All right. <laughs> Uh, now, the thing about <laughs> an ecosystem that moves that quickly is that it can be a real challenge to keep up. Um, I, I know this personally because I've built kind of a career around trying to be the person who knows Android first and, and comes and shares it with people you know, right off the bat. And when Android first la launched back in the early days, it was really easy. You'd spend a weekend, 
on a sample app, write a blog post, and you were done. You were the expert. And then the platform got bigger and bigger, and uh, that kind of gradually grew into increasingly thick books over the years. And these days, you really need a whole team of people to be able to sift through all of the opportunities, all of the different form factors, APIs, platforms, Google Play services, and everything else. And that introduces kind of its own challenge. We need to figure out what is the best way to invest our time, our energy, and our resources in order to be able to get the best return on that investment. Now, I've spent a lot of time talking on stages like this about easy things that you can do to make your apps better. And really, though, that's shorthand for these are things that are possible to do and hopefully are the right things to invest in in order to get that, that high return. Because I think we can speak honestly. We know that building any kind of mobile app on any platform isn't easy. It's, it's kind of hard. It's hard to get right. It's hard to design. It's hard to implement. And so we're really looking for the right ways to be able to invest. How do we make sure that we're spending the right effort, the right time, on the things which are going to get us the best impact? Because realistically speaking, hard is relative. Now, for me, my standard is if you're writing code in, in one of these boxes uh, on the high C, somewhere out around here, uh, for six weeks at a time while blue, green water's splashing over the back deck, that's pretty hard. Uh, growing up in the 90s, thinking that this was a cool way to spend a Saturday night was pretty hard. But we're all engineers in this room, so we know that building Android apps isn't that hard um, from an engineering perspective, of all, uh, engineering perspective, at least. Because uh, learning new APIs is kind of what we do. That's kind of how we make our careers work. And of course, these days, with things like Android Studio nearing a 1.0 release, the tooling the development environment has been getting easier over time. Things have been getting better um, as, as the ecosystem and the platform has evolved. But what's always been difficult and continues to be a challenge is figuring out those opportunities. When do you invest the time and effort in something, particularly when it's new, before it already has a large share of the market? Now, back in 2008, when Android was the engineering equivalent of being pre-IPO, Success was anything but guaranteed. The people who were willing to invest then were taking a big risk. Would Android ever actually be a thing? Is this something which is actually going to be used by people? Is there a market there? So the people who invested then had a great opportunity for a big return for, at the price of having that risk. Now, by the time we get to around 2010, when Android really went big, Android, the Nexus One launched, the Motorola Droid launched, suddenly you've got an available market. The risk drops significantly. It's obviously a huge opportunity to develop for the platform. Now today, of course, the ecosystem is a lot more mature. So we have to work harder to find ways to get that high investment. And that means finding new ways to increase the risk. So if you want to have those big returns, you need to either invest more or invest early on new opportunities which everyone else hasn't already gotten on board with. And it's the same for the platform. That's a lot of what we've been doing at Google, is trying to find ways to invest our expertise, our time and effort in something which is going to help continue to grow Android beyond where it already is. And in both cases, both for app development and for platform development, it's really an easy way to spot the opportunity, and that is to focus on the user. And increasingly, that means focusing on increasing the quality of what we're providing. Now, for Android as a platform, that's meant investing significant engineering efforts to improve the user experience by doing things like making the UI buttery smooth with Project Butter, uh, ensuring that it can run on a wide range of devices, including those with much more limited capacities than some of the fancy new devices we showed at the beginning, with things like Project Svelte. And I think something which all of us are happy to see is an increased effort to try and make the batteries last longer on all of our devices. So all of this is about increasing the user experience. And of course, on top of all of that, probably one of the biggest changes we've had in Android over the last few years is material design. A whole new design language for being able to make users understand how to use your apps more easily and feel more comfortable using mobile devices. Now, for us as developers, that means trying to take advantage of those opportunities to try and offer a better experience. And so for the remainder of this keynote, we're going to be looking at some of the latest Android improvements, some of the things which are pretty early on, things like Lollipop, which haven't yet got that wide distribution, things like Android Wear, Android TV, all of which represent these big opportunities for the future, 
if you're willing to invest in that now. Actually, quick poll. Who in the audience has an OTA so far? Who's actually running Lollipop? Not bad. OK, sort of, you know, sort of an audience that might have it anyway, but I was sort of curious how far it had gotten so far. So uh, we're going to highlight some of these investment opportunities that we think are going to offer you the best return. Keep in mind that uh, we are not financial advisors, and so some of, this, uh, some of this advice is for you to decide whether or not it is what you want to invest in. Uh, so what better a place to start than having a look at the newest APIs available in the latest Android release, uh, Android 5.0, Lollipop. And of course, that means getting a much better understanding of one of the biggest updates to Android, which is material design. Now, the whole goal of material design is to create an engaging interface that behaves and reacts like a real physical surface. And that means creating something that's tangible, uh, something with layered surfaces, with bold and striking aesthetic choices, things which make objects and screen, ele screen elements move in a way that helps users understand what's happening so that they can see exactly what their interactions are leading with. All of the movement, all of the reactions for everything that happens ripples out from that point of interaction. And that helps users understand what's happening and what the results of their interactions are. Now, the material metaphor is really what underlies everything about this new design language. It combines a virtual space and a system of motion that's inspired by paper and ink, and it, it gives a tactile, tactile feeling of something real. But it also provides opportunities for imagination, for magic. And so while we're trying to, to create something which feels like a real thing, that doesn't mean that it has to behave exactly the same way as a real thing in real life. It doesn't have to behave as if it is a representation of a physical object. It just needs to be consistent with its own physics and its own reality. So that means just like real life objects, surfaces, and edges all offer visual cues and make it easier for users to understand how things interact. So we, that includes things like realistic lighting that shows seams and divides space and indicates all of the moving parts. And all of that helps draw user attention towards the most important screen elements. And all of that works towards making it easier for users to understand how to interact. But of course, we're not tied to interactions that are possible in the physical world. Like I said, we're looking to create new interactions. Now, of course, all of this looks really nice, but how do we actually implement this stuff? Uh, luckily, we have one of the people who helped implement this stuff on the framework here to tell us a little bit more about it. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Chet to talk a little bit about how we make some of this stuff happen. So I lead the UI Toolkit team, which is basically the team responsible for all of the views on the screen and the graphics that render them and issuing the commands into OpenGL that turn them into pixels on the screen. So basically the entire graphics stack down from the UI all the way down to uh, the drivers. Um, which means that when uh, the design department decided to come up with this grand vision uh, and wrote a bunch of After Effects demos to show how pretty that it could be, um, that it landed on our group to figure out how to actually implement this stuff. So I'll talk about various slices of this, um, how we implemented the various pieces of material design. Um, so in particular, I'll talk about the new theme, what, what you get for free. And, and one of the elements to um, realize here is that I will talk about a bunch of new APIs and a bunch of new capabilities, um, things that you can do in your applications. But for the most part, you do not have to do that much just to become a basic uh, material design application. If you opt into the theme, either through the material theme directly or through AppCompat, then you get a lot of the stuff for free because basically we've implemented it for the standard widget set uh, that you're going to use in your application. If you want to go beyond that and implement more custom animations um, and more custom look and feels for your custom views, go for it. Um, but don't be overwhelmed with the APIs and think, oh no, all this work to do. Uh, no, it's standard Android programming and a lot of the stuff that we've done for material design just sort of comes for free out of the box. So I'll talk about the theme, I'll talk about some of the new widgets we enabled and some of the new APIs uh, which we use internally to enable this stuff and which you can use, choose to use uh, externally in your application as well. The material theme is android.material, no big surprise there. Um, once you opt into this theme, either by using it directly if you're targeting uh, the L release, or if you're using AppCompat, then it will internally target the material theme uh, on that runtime platform. Then you get the colors uh, that we have prescribed um, for the standard look and feel. You get uh, the widgets, the standard icons. You get things like buttons with a, a drop shadow behind it. You get touch feedback ripples, uh, the indication of not just that the user is interacting with the widget, but how and where 
uh, they're interacting with it. And you also enable activity transitions, which are a set of richer animations that you can have going uh, between activities. Um, we'll talk about all of these in a little more detail as we go forward. Um, some of the new widgets that we enabled uh, are both in um, the support library in V7, so you can use Recycler View, um, which, how many people use List View right now? And how many people enjoy it? I should lower my hand as well, right? So, incredibly powerful, written to uh, basically enable a lot of capabilities um, and a lot of very fast user interactions, like flinging a list on devices that simply don't have the capability to recreate and generate a lot of garbage on the fly. So there's a lot of sort of magical stuff that's going on with recycling views underneath, just so that it can perform under those constraints. But it, it makes it a little bit tricky to use. Um, and when you want to do things like animate list view items, then you need uh, developer relations department to go out and produce like 10 or 20 videos telling you how to enable these little tiny animations in specific cases because it's really tricky to, to work with. Um, Recycler view is, is intended to be a replacement for a list view, um, much more pluggable and flexible. So now you're not constrained to just have a vertical list view. Now you can actually go both vertically and horizontally, huge. Absolutely huge. You could have done this in the past with list view if you simply rotated the device. Um, but apart from that, you were, you were kind of constrained. Um, so pluggable layouts, um, as well as default item animations and the ability to plug in more custom animations if you want them. Um, uh, adapters that you can plug in. And we come with uh, defaults and um, templates that you can use out of the box uh, for various things. We're still working on some. There's no cursor adapter right now. You could use Recycler View with cursors, but you'll need to write your own adapter for now. Um, so it's still in development. It's not a full replacement for List View, um, but it is, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the future. Uh, another widget that we enabled was Card View, very simple layout container. Um, it's not even necessary that it's there. We debated whether we should even write a widget around it because basically it's just a frame layout with some padding, um, some standard corner rounding, and a standard elevation. The thing that it does give you is a common look and feel among and across applications that use this same widget. Um, so it's a little bit easier to just use the standard one rather than everybody creating their own in slightly different ways. The other thing that it gives you is the ability to target both the lollipop release, where we use real-time shadows um, and real view clipping for the rounded edges, and earlier releases in a way where we can make the shadow look almost as good and have the, the rounded corners be almost as good, um, but with the constraints that are necessary on earlier platforms where we didn't have the same rendering capabilities. Um, and these are both in V7, and there's some other things that we added to the support library along the way that we'll talk about later. Um, one of the major efforts that we did in the toolkit team in this release was for real-time shadows. Um, so initially, when the design team said, OK, well, we want this volume that we're going to boost views out into, they'll have this default elevation. As they move around, the shadows are reacting to moving around according to this local area light source. And we're listening to all these details, thinking, how are we going to do this in real time? And then in the background, we see their full-on, high-end, top-of-the-line um, workstation processing one frame of uh, like two cards on the screen plus the status bar with some very subtle shadows that you could hardly even detect. And it was taking 35 seconds to render this in some animation software. And they said, oh, and by the way, let's do this at 60 frames a second. So we spent a while doing that, um, and it actually worked. Um, there are some trade-offs in order to do this on constrained devices um, and non-infinite CPU and GPU resources. Uh, but we actually do this. We have a local area light source. As you move shadowed objects around on the screen, you can see the shadow react in real time. We're basically calculating meshes and sending down massive amounts of geometry uh, to the GPU on the fly to do this. And we're doing it in a way that's fairly efficient because this is actually what GPUs love. Send them two triangles representing a button. They're not terribly interested. Send them a mesh with 500 triangles representing a shadow. They go gangbusters on it. Um, so we take advantage of GPU resources to do what it is um, that they do best, and we actually manage to get really good frame rates out of it uh, at the same time. There's some simple APIs you can opt into. Uh, some of our widgets come with this stuff embedded in, so buttons are automatically boosted by, I believe, four dips. So they're sitting at a permanent elevation that casts a little subtle um, shadow uh, below 
the buttons. Um, but you can use the elevation API. You can also use the translation Z property, um, which is used for animations for sort of temporary or, or transient elevation. As you click on a button, it raises temporarily uh, and then lowers again, and that's used uh, using the translation Z property. Um, there's also the ability to tell us what shape that shadow should be, because in the real world of UIs, not everything is a simple rectangle. Um, so we can actually uh, shadow simple objects like rounded rects um, and circles as well, and we can also clip the views to those same shapes. Um, and we use this internally for some of the default shapes, so if you're creating a floating action button, which is a circular shape, then you can tell us, uh, the, then you can use a circle um, shape drawable, and we'll automatically know that that's the shape that we should clip to, as well as the shape that we should shadow to, and that's using the outline class um, and the ability to tell view, uh, a view what outline it has and have it update as the view changes um, size around on the screen. Nice. So the thing about uh, design language is that it's much easier <coughs> to show than it is to tell. Uh, so I'm going to try and let the examples speak for themselves as much as possible. Um, but the goal really is to use deliberate color choices. So you can see that in a lot of the examples that we're putting up on the screen. It's edge-to-edge -edge imagery, large-scale typography, intentional use of white space, and they all create this really immersive user experience. It's the same core elements that we've been using in print design for a long time. Things like typography, grids, spacing, scale. Really, it's, it's, it's stuff which we've, we've been using a lot of the time for things which are already in paper. And we're trying to find a way to take advantage of those things, things which people are used to, to create a much better, much more immersive experience on our devices. Now, as well as the use of immersive contextual imagery, they, they do more than just look good. Right, they create hierarchy, they create meaning, and focus that really makes the functionality more obvious. And it gives your users waypoints as they progress through the app. Now, color is a big part of that. And you'll notice that material design apps don't shy away from bold, bright colors that can be used to really emphasize your branding and the visual identity of your app, as well as directing user attention. Now, this works really well when the content itself can influence the colors used by other visual elements. Like you can see here, where the, uh, the, the, the background of the artist's name and the album name is being influenced by the dominant color uh, of, the, of the album itself. Um, how does this sort of stuff work? So one of the big changes with material design is that we wanted to get away from the, real, the, the world that developers have been dealing with for years where it, you could certainly brand your application, and people do. If you're Netflix, you probably have a deep red color baked into all your assets throughout your activities. Um, and if you want to have a different color scheme like uh, red on black, then you're going to bake black into different assets that you call up when you launch into those sub-activities. Wouldn't it be nice to actually live in a world where the assets were geometry or simple grayscale uh, bitmaps that you could then just tint uh, on the fly as necessary? So that was the approach that we took um, with material design in two different ways. Um, first of all, there's the theming way where you can tell us uh, the value of certain colors. For any activity, you can tell us about uh, the color primary or the color primary dark, and we'll automatically assign that color to standard assets like the background color or the status bar or accent colors um, that are used in the standard widgets and containers. Um, so you automatically get some default branding in your activity. Um, the other way that we uh, apply color is by doing it dynamically. Um, so the thing that Rado was referring to with uh, grabbing colors from images, that's using a new utility library in the support library called Palette. Uh, and you can give it a bitmap and then request uh, information about the dominant and contrasting colors in there, including contrasting text colors. And it can automatically derive those colors. You can ask for those colors back, and then you can set the tint on your drawables according to what those are. So in this particularly unattractive demo app that I wrote, uh, you can see that I'm doing that. The flamingo there, I derived this, uh, this color blue, which I, I wouldn't have done that by default, but it's a nice sort of matching contrast um, with the pink and the flamingo, and it came directly from the bitmap data. And I simply set the tint on the background drawable that I was using. Um, there. Similarly for uh, the mountain or the brown color in the canyon shot down there. Um, so this is all done dynamically. So there's the theming colors that you do that's sort of the default, what your activity is going to look like by default. And then there's the dynamic colors that you can set according to imagery that comes in from your application, from the web, from whatever resources you want. And then you call set tint to um, <clears throat> set those colors and, and brand your application experience further. 
Uh, now, the, uh, the next part of our material design language is something very close to Chet's heart. It's, a, it's around animation, meaningful motion. It's a huge part of material design. And it's designed so that every visual change and every user interaction reinforces the idea that the user is the cause of the change. And the material is going to react accordingly based on their interaction. So that means that even simple actions initiate changes through motion that can transform the whole design. It, but it's a transformation of the app's environment rather than a transition to a new screen. So rather than opening up a new activity which layers on top, you can see in, in something like this example, it's modifying what's already there. You can see that this, um, you know, this calendar appointment is zooming out in order to give you that extra detail. So the objects and the visual elements on the screen are transformed and reorganized in a way that's in line with the user action and their expectations. You can see that transition between states. And so that results in motion that is meaningful. It serves to focus the attention and maintain continuity. So the way that things move gives cues to users about how things work. And because the eyes are naturally drawn to the movement, animation can direct user focus. For example, here, if the player controls are the primary interaction, the animation can really point that out. So you'll notice that even small interactions radiate outwards, making subtle changes to the UI and it's a total departure from that instantaneous state change world that we've come from, where UIs change and switch in a way that can seem unexpected based on what you happen to press at the time. I'm going to hand over to Chet. It's a fairly large amount of stuff that he's going to cover from this point, because we're really getting into uh, the framework stuff at this point. Yeah, we'll get to the end of the visual stuff, and then we'll cover a bunch of other platform capabilities that we enabled. Uh, not quite so visual, but just as important. Um, so for, first of all, let's talk about animations, because I like to. Um, so there were a lot of new uh, capabilities as well as APIs that we added around animations to enable all of the material design interaction and transition stuff that Rado was referring to. Um, one of the biggest pieces of that was activity transitions. Um, this is the idea that, that when you go from activity to activity, it would be nice to have a rich animation to, to help the user understand what's actually going on. And this is, um, you can think of this as being three distinct parts. There's animating the items out from the old activity. There's animating item, uh, the new items in into the new activity window. And then there's potentially shared elements that are going to be in both of these activities that you want to help um, transition the user over with. So for example, you could have a list of albums. You will click on an album, and then you're going to see that same album cover, maybe with uh, different sizing or different resolution, and then a list of the songs in that album. Wouldn't it be nice if you didn't just flash the user from one UI to another, but instead you actually transition them in this experience that, that brought them over with that same album cover. So activity transitions is enabling all of those capabilities. You could do this, to be clear, you could do this already um, but in very unobvious and in some ways um, non-performant ways by launching a transparent window and then animating things in, in the new activity. Uh, we've done dev bytes around how to do this in the past. So if you want to do it on all your releases, you can do it, um, but in very specific corner cases. Um, and, and good luck figuring it out without that, uh, the dev byte videos. Um, so we instead enabled new APIs to make it much more obvious and easy as well as uh, more performant to do this. Um, so check out Activity Transitions to do that. Um, and we have various uh, demos and videos to help you figure that out. We also enabled easier ways of getting animation curves. And this is curves in terms of both uh, timing as well as um, spatial curves. So we have the ability already to get arbitrary uh, timing interpolation through the time interpolator class. And we have several that we offer by default. And you can do your own uh, custom timing interpolation. Um, designers really like to think in terms of paths, in terms of uh, Bezier um, quadratic and cubic Bezier curves. Um, I don't know why, but that's what their tools like to do. So we enabled uh, a way to uh, easily use cubes to determine uh, timing curves as well. So you can more easily go back and forth between designers and what they're looking for in terms of a, a timing experience and developers in terms of the code that they have to write to support it. Also, spatial curves. Again, this was possible before, but I wrote a long article about how to do it about three years ago. Um, so it was non-obvious uh, to do on your own. Now we've baked it into the API, so it's easy now to create uh, a motion curve that animates both X and Y in a nice, organic, natural flowing motion. So if a widget is moving from the upper left down to the lower right, wouldn't it be nice if it didn't simply move in a straight line between the two, but used a more natural curve along the way? 
Um, and then finally, we enabled the idea of an animated reveal, another way of transitioning the user from one experience to another. Um, so we can see a couple of these elements in the videos here. Uh, first of all, on the left, I have a simple demo that I wrote. Um, you'll see this uh, more later if you go to the material witness talk. Um, this rather seizure-inducing uh, demo here shows a crossfade of the items that are going away in the previous activity and a shared element that's launching from one activity to the next. Um, and then there's no new elements in the new activity, but um, you can certainly play with this and customize the types of animations as well as um, the items that are being animated between the activities. On the right, another demo that's in the later material witness talk. You can see the animated reveal as we uh, progressively um, uh, if that's for me, uh, tell them I'll be free in 25 minutes. Um, as we progressively reveal um, the view underneath uh, and then collapse the reveal to go back to the um, previous um, view without the map. Uh, and there were changes to icons as well um, in a couple of ways that we've already talked about before. The preview release, uh, we have touch feedback ripples. This is really subtle, so I'm not sure if you can see it. We're showing a ripple not just um, that the user is selecting uh, or pressing this view, but also where the user interacted with the view. Um, and something new since preview is the idea um, that we now have vectors that we can use for icons. So we use uh, path data in the same format that you may be familiar with from, from SVG. You can use the same geometry specification of doing move to, line to, curve to, um, to enable uh, richer animations um, of vector icons that uh, can scale to different resolutions um, in a nice way. Uh, and you can see this rather strange demo on the right that shows um, various animations there. We can do both geometry morphs from different representations of paths, um, as well as animations of any of the other properties in these vector drawables, such as colors, or the start and the end positions of the paths, or the stroke width, or the fill um, color. All of these different things uh, can be uh, represented in geometry, as well as animated uh, with the animated version of vector drawables. Um, so I don't want to get into the details too deeply here, uh, but the vector drawable class you can sort of see in that path data element toward the end, um, this sort of hard to read string of geometry. We don't actually expect you to hand code this stuff. Um, there are tools that create geometry uh, for SVG and you can basically copy paste. There are some constraints. Um, another of the trade-offs that we, that we have for actually getting this stuff to run in real time is that we require that the paths be um, closed and non-intersecting. <laughs> Uh, and otherwise, I mean, it basically handles what SVG will in terms of raw geometry, but if you go a little too crazy on that, you may find that it's not working correctly. Um, and other simple attributes you can see in that file. And then the animated side of it, you can think of it as being three separate parts. You have a, a file that refers to the geometry, which is that vector drawable that we just saw in the previous slide. It says, here's the base geometry to start from and the basic properties of my icon. And then here are some animations that I'm going to run on properties of that geometry, be it the path data itself or things like the stroke color or the stroke width or the trim start and trim end. Uh, another capability we enabled is nested scrolling. This is something else that was possible, but it, you basically had to use the single hammer of gestures and motion detection um, to handle everything. Uh, and it got a bit uh, tricky and artifacty. Um, so we enabled the capability of having nested scrolling. This is the idea that you can have a scrolling container within another scrolling container. And when you reach the end of one, maybe you'd like to forward that information and allow its parent to carry on from there. So um, as, you, as you scroll an item down, maybe that can bring the header into view uh, when it reaches the end of its content and um, also in reverse. Um, so check out those APIs. Render thread is a bit in the implementation details for probably most of the people in the audience, but I like it. Um, in Android, we uh, have and will always have the requirement that all view manipulations need to, handle, need to happen on the single UI toolkit thread. Um, that is still the case and will continue to be so. However, there are two parts to rendering. There is the creation of the commands that draw the view and there's the issuing of those commands to the GPU. We've now broken that out into a separate thread, which would be irrelevant except for the fact that once we can do that, now we can also forward information about animations to that separate thread and they can run autonomously on that separate thread. Um, this is seen in two specific types of animations right now. The reveal animation that we saw in the earlier demo of, of revealing the map, 
Um, that can now run autonomously on the separate thread without um, being beholden to stalls on the UI toolkit thread. And the other is ripples. So you can imagine pressing a button that's going to launch a sub-activity. You'd like to see that ripple happen in the way that it should without stalling out because now you're inflating another activity on the same process and the UI toolkit thread um, is held hostage to that inflation. Um, so that actually happens. So the ripple now runs on the render thread at the same time as the UI toolkit thread is busy doing something else. Um, so this is all about reducing overall system jank and making everything smoother in general. Um, I expect more improvements here to come. There was a lot of what I would call plumbing work done in Lollipop to enable this, and now we can build on this going forward. In Support lib uh, Library, we've talked about some of these elements already. Um, some of the other bits that came online in Support Library around a bitmap drawable. This is sort of uh, a necessary part of doing the card view widget. View property animator compat, again, a necessary part of doing recycler view. Uh, animations, um, as well as notification compat. Some of the notification capabilities we'll allude to later um, are now uh, available in the support library. There were recently web view updates uh, going up to M37, important web standards like web audio, web GL, and web RTC. And something else that was announced recently is the ability to uh, update from the Play Store, which means that uh, you could potentially get updates to web view capabilities outside of regular platform Update. So before, yeah, we would update WebView whenever we would update to, let's say, the L release. Um, but uh, that was all. Um, so now you can get things uh, out of band updated. Uh, no announcements on specific capabilities that'll be updated or when those will happen, but um, the ability exists uh, to do that at least. So in the system UI area, um, there were a few important changes. One is document-centric apps. If anybody has run Lollipop so far and run Recents, you may see things like um, uh, let's say Chrome with several tabs, uh, several elements, um, thumbnails in the recents list. And that's because each of the tabs now launches into a separate, um, call it document. Uh, so you can have one single process, one application that can choose to actually launch separate documents instead of having everybody go back to the single view of something that is mer maybe uh, inherently multi-page like Chrome tabs. Um, so you can opt into this. By default, you're in the same single task, single activity model that you were in before, um, but you can opt into having several tasks instead. Um, there was changes to the UI, so the idea that we have these nice rounded cards with this uh, bold material design look to them. Uh, there's also um, some uh, capabilities in terms of colors and the ability to further brand the application experience. So you can set the color um, and your large icons will automatically fill in with this color in the background. Uh, you need to use these alpha icons um, so that uh, we can do the appropriate thing be behind your icon and you don't need to bake in your colors into all your assets. Um, and for the small icons, we'll, we'll automatically uh, badge your application. Again, it's all about the branding. Uh, and everything else that you know and love about rich notifications, the ability to, to have controlling aspects and notifications um, carries on from what it did previously. Heads up notifications is pretty huge. If you've ever been in the middle of an incredibly important game and then you got a call from let's say your spouse and then it just launched into the phone call just assuming that I wanted to answer the phone at that time, well you now have the option. Um, so it'll pop up a heads up notification for these full screen intents uh, including the phone so that you can choose whether you actually want to be interrupted, interrupted from this um, truly important gaming experience uh, or if you want to carry on and, and risk everything about your future happiness. <laughs> um, big change if people have uh, used the device, probably the first thing you noticed is that, <coughs> excuse me, when you turn it on, you'll see notifications on the lock screen. Um, this is really powerful because now it's just one click to actually see the important information. You get a buzz in your pocket, you take out your phone, you turn it on, you see whether you need to, to react to whatever is going on in your life at that moment, and then you can choose to log in and, and do something about it. Um, the important aspect of this is privacy, of course, because what if I have corp email on my phone? I probably don't want those message headers displayed on the lock screen in case I leave my phone in, say, a bar in San Mateo. It wouldn't happen. No, no, no. I mean, it wouldn't happen. It's just a hypothetical. Um, <laughs> but if it did, uh, maybe I didn't want those headers on the lock screen. Um, so there are two ways for users to, um, to react to that privacy implication. One is on the developer side, you have what we call spheres of visibility that you can declare for any notification, whether this is information that should be publicly consumable. So this is public. No one's going to care whether this is on the screen. Um, so 
we can do that. Or we have this private information. No, 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 the user really needs to log into the lock screen to see this. And then we have this in-between area. Um, that's the lock screen area. We have this in-between where maybe for corp email, it's OK to let anybody know that Chet has received that email, but it's not OK to let them know the contents of the message header. So there can be a publicly viewable uh, uh, manifestation of private information. Um, so there's sort of that in-between area. And then finally, there's a completely secret, um, don't show them this thing unless they're actually logged into the device. So that's on the developer side. And then on the user side, they also have a way through settings to enable what type of information that they want. So they can further clamp down on those settings and uh, choose to display less on the lock screen as well. In the media area, lots of um, various changes at, at sort of a lower level of the system. In OpenGL, uh, we now allow access to OpenGL ES 3.1 on devices that have it, so you can detect that um, and use those APIs when they exist. Lots of new uh, good capabilities, compute shaders, um, and various shading language improvements. We also enabled something called the Android Extension Pack. If you used OpenGL in the past, if you wanted to use a capability which was not standard in that version of OpenGL, then you would query for that extension. And then there's another extension that you want, and you'd query for that, and you'd sort of have this, this infinite matrix of all the different extensions you wanted to use. What we wanted was a, an overall broadening of the capabilities for everyone. So we uh, got together with the partners, and we uh, came up with a list of capabilities that most of them were able to offer anyway, and we offer these as sort of an, an all-in-one pack. So you can query for the extension pack and automatically know that if that extension pack is there, you can bank on all of these capabilities, which basically bring the devices up to um, the capabilities of modern day uh, gaming consoles. Um, things like tessellation, geometry shaders, um, texture compression is pretty awesome. Um, so that is coming online. Uh, these are both capabilities that, you know, on devices that offer them, they are there and there are ways to query them. Uh, and then in your application, you would simply run the query uh, and then uh, bet on them or find a workaround if those capabilities don't exist on that particular runtime. In the camera area, um, the ability to capture raw, um, better image processing capabilities. Um, <coughs> also, a lot of focus in recent releases on latency in the audio area, which I think anybody dealing with audio would be happy with. In this particular release, we were dealing with audio input latency, um, so that is much improved. Um, in other media stuff, we have this media session object, um, which standardizes the control standard things that you can listen to for play, pause, stop, all the stuff that basically you had to manually encode in your application before. Everybody did it in a little different way. There was a lot of stuff that you had to do to get there, so now we do it for you and expose it in a standard way, and you can focus on writing the UI controls around it. Uh, media browser, um, the ability to um, to browse or to expose uh, media content that you want other people to be able to browse. And media projection um, for screen capture as well as audio capture. At an even lower level, lots of system changes going on. Um, so art. Uh, so of the people that are running on L, who is choosing to use art? And the answer is everybody. Um, so we came out with art in the KitKat release and it was off by default. So you could choose as a developer, and you should have chosen to enable art and see how your application responded to it. There were some kinks to work out. Um, there were some issues, especially with moving memory around, uh, that we needed to uh, improve over time before we could enable this as the default. Um, so in L, not only is it the default, it is the only fault. Um, it's uh, the runtime for everybody. Dalvik no longer exists. Um, this is a good thing in general. It's a more performance uh, runtime. It has uh, most excellent things like uh, less and faster GC pauses. And one of the reasons for that is that we now have a separate heap um, for large objects like bitmaps. Um, so before, if the garbage collector needed to allocate a memory for an object that you asked for, then it would walk the entire heap looking for space. And if there's a lot of large objects in there, it's going to do a lot of walking. And the large objects are fragmenting the heap and making this a more time-consuming operation every single time. And then it would need to do a collection because there wasn't enough room and, and on and on. And then you'd get pause times of easily 15 to 20 milliseconds, which would pop you right over one of those frame boundaries. And the user might see a pause in the middle of an animation and an overall um, worse experience in general than, than what we wanted to go for. So with art, now we have separate allocation area for large bitmaps, which makes it faster to both collect and allocate um, for either large objects or small objects, uh, making the pause times more like two to three milliseconds in general. 
um, making it much easier for you to then keep your application inside the 16 millisecond frame boundary for nice smooth animations and graphics. Um, so uh, good stuff. I would expect more improvements in there uh, in the future. Oh, the other cool thing is that it's now a moving collector. So when your app goes into the background, it's actually able to defragment the heap, which was never possible with Dalvik. Um, so it's, it's much better longevity for uh, GC behavior um, in each of the applications as well. Project Volta, I'm going to rip through some of this stuff pretty quickly. Um, this is a utility that, like most of the tools um, for the platform, we developed it because we needed it uh, internally to monitor our own battery usage and improve system battery uh, metrics overall. So we came up with this thing called Battery Stats, so you can easily do a, a dump of the Battery Stats info um, and see what's going on in all the processes in the system. And you can get this uh, tool called Battery Historian, uh, which allows you to visualize what's going on with batteries. Um, so you can download that, you can run it, you can do a dump sys, basically uh, put this information into a bug report, and then run the Historian script on it um, to see what's going on. And it gives you a display kind of like uh, SysTrace, um, graphical display of what's actually going on there. Job scheduler. Um, what you want to do in general if you, if you want to like go query the network, maybe you want to wait uh, until the system is actually on Wi-Fi or it's plugged in because it's going to use a lot of power. Um, so it was possible to do this before, but it was a very manual process and it required the system to wake up more often than it needed to um, because maybe it would wake up and realize it wasn't a good time for this and then you'd set an alarm and wake up sometime later. So now we have the job scheduler API to do this for you so you can automatically tell it the, the kind of metrics like I want to do this thing when I'm plugged in or when I'm on Wi-Fi and it will automatically set these alarms internally and wake up at an appropriate time and then call you back. Um, document trees in the storage access framework, uh, we have the ability to work uh, more powerfully with individual files. Now in Lollipop, you can actually work with directories of files, sort of an obvious thing, um, but wasn't there in KitKat and now exists in Lollipop. Um, also the ability to get the media directories, what people are actually uh, browsing for and accessing a lot are media content. Um, so it's much easier now to, uh, to work with this more directly, requires less effort on your part. Um, Multi-networking allows you to not just connect to networks, but to connect to networks of specific types. Um, Bluetooth LE is about actually providing as well as scanning services um, both at the same time, so just more capabilities for uh, Bluetooth LE in general. Um, on the enterprise side, this is about the idea of having managed profiles. So you have users, you have restricted users, you have a profile owner versus a device owner, so the person using it as opposed to maybe the corporate IT department that wants control over some aspects of the device. Um, and then the device policy manager that works with that. I would expect uh, more capabilities here. Uh, there was a lot of, uh, as I said, plumbing work uh, being done in Lollipop to enable the raw capabilities of these different types of user profiles. Um, and then we'll probably build on that going forward. All right, so not that many changes then for Android 5. It's, uh, just two or three. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right, so I'm going to take a big step back out um, from some of that low-level stuff that Chet was going through and, and talk a little bit about sort of the, the final part of material design. Uh, which is about being adaptive, uh, which really means that you, uh, your app needs to be designed and optimized for the device that it's going to be running on, right? And that's an increasingly wide variety of devices. And that's probably the biggest area in which we're seeing Android continuing to grow and evolve, is to have it be the platform for more than just phones and tablets. Now, back in the day, computers used to look very different to how they do now. They used to fill a whole room, and when you sat down to work at one, that's what you were doing. You were sitting down to work at your computer. That, that's what the designers were using when they were running real-time shadows. That makes a lot of sense. Today, of course, technology works for us in many more places than just <coughs> at work. We bring it into our, into our lives, and it fits. It becomes part of what we do and how we interact with the world. It assists, it entertains, it's really a, a part of, of our lifestyles. And the thing is, it's in all of these different kinds of form factors. But there's a co common element across all of these different ways to compute. And there's a specific way that each of these things fit into our lives. And put as simply as possible, the user experience should feel effortless. Now, the idea of effortless design is one that binds all the things that we do into these new form factors. And again, it's this idea of effortless design is, is the one thing that binds them together. There's another thing that this does, that does this really well, binds all of these things together, and that's Android. 
Uh, and I do mean to say that the hard part here is the design. Now we'll keep coming back to that quickly as I go through the, uh, these, these next slides. But we're going to take a closer look at the design for each of these form factors and really highlight how these things should work together. So you'll see that there are subtle differences both in the design and the development as we approach each of these different form factors. So I'm just going to highlight a few top level things for each of them so that we can go through this pretty quickly. The first is Android Wear. We'll start there. Um, now first, the design considerations, as I say. The first thing to keep in mind when designing for Android Wear devices is glanceability. Right? It's that classic wristwatch look and feel where you want to be able to just glance quickly at your wrist and in a split second get the information that you need and continue on with your life. And that's exactly the way that Wear should work in the same sort of user experience as a wristwatch, but for more than just telling the time. So the less time it takes to use your software, the more time the user can do to be present in what they're actually doing so that it doesn't become a distraction. It doesn't pull people out of their life. It's just a way of being able to be more informed while they're living. So Android Wear is fast, it's sharp, and it's immediate. And wearable apps have this advantage of being fully aware of the user's context. The time it is, where they are, what they're actually doing, all of these things can factor into how your wearable app is going to you know, be able to be used. Now, the way that it works is that, Android's, uh, that apps use this information to insert cards into that stream on their devices when they become relevant. So you're not interacting, sort of searching through your device. It's telling you stuff when you need to know it, based on the context. And that means that Android Wear apps should be timely, relevant, and really specific. Now, to get this done in the simplest way, your app's notifications are displayed on Wear devices for free. Uh, and you can improve on that. So obviously, the enhanced notifications, actions, those sorts of things, they all also show up on the wearables. So it's, again, something else you get for free just by making the notifications for your app better and richer. Uh, and similarly, if you use the remote control client um, for your app, that will all work on Android Wear as well. And then you can go a step further. You can add uh, features like stacks, pages, and replies to add more interactivity, more information based on what your app needs to display. If you want to take it a step further from that, you can actually build APKs for the Android Wear device. And that lets you do basically anything you want. You can create completely custom UI, completely custom user uh, interaction. Uh, I'll skip some of this stuff. So really, when you're doing it that way, you have that ability to send data between your device uh, and uh, between your wearable device and the phone. So you're able to send data in both directions and, and control everything that way. Now, in general, you should be creating notifications on the handheld and letting them sync automatically to the wearable. Just make those notifications as rich as possible. And that means that you can just build it once and take advantage of all the different wearable form factors which are going to use that as an approach. Uh, if that doesn't work, then you can start to build on it with stacks and pages. If that's still not enough, then you can start looking at building something custom, particularly if you're using the sensors and things on the device itself. Again, voice actions is a, a really good thing to take advantage of. Uh, when you're talking about a wearable, you want to have as little physical interaction as possible, and so taking advantage of voice actions to handle those interactions can be really, really powerful. Next thing I want to talk about real quick, Android TV. Uh, Nexus Player was announced along with Lollipop. It's a pretty cool device. It does streaming, gaming. It's Google Cast ready. Really, the main thing to keep in mind here when you're talking about design for Android TV is that it should be fun and easy. It should be casual. You should interact with it the same way that you would your television. So you're looking to optimize activities that put content at the center of the experience. Think of things like watching movies, immersive gaming, hanging out with friends in the living room. But it should also be a cinematic experience. It should be rich and immersive and bold. So you want to design for as little user interface as possible and as much content as possible. The Chrome shouldn't get in the way. It should be mainly about the content that you're displaying. You want to avoid things like on-screen text. You want to tell your story with pictures and sound, which is the way we're used to engaging with a, a TV experience. Uh, and one of the newest things, uh, which we, I think, formally launched just yesterday, um, is Android Auto. Now, it's still really early days for a lot of this stuff. But hopefully it's something you get a chance to build on soon. And obviously we've announced the API, so you can start to download this and, and play with it now to see how your experiences might work within uh, the auto environment. So we've got a few highlights. It's, it's an interesting 
sort of platform. It's something which is quite different to everything we've done on Android beforehand. So again, it, it represents that real opportunity to invest in something quite early. Now you can see that the idea is that it's, it's naturally integrated. We should be creating things which feel like they belong within the automotive experience. You want to think about blending the user's app experience with their in-car experience. It, it shouldn't feel alien or foreign. It should be quick, easy to use, easy to understand, and it should be clear why this is being made available to you. You want to enhance what's already there rather than trying to replace it and create a completely new experience. So that means that you need to consider things like day and night transitions. Right? This isn't something which we typically need to think about when developing for phones or tablets. On cars, that suddenly becomes really important. If it's nighttime, you don't want to have a primarily white display blinding the driver as they're trying to drive. You want to switch everything into dark, subdued colors the way that your GPS will. Uh, all of the UIs on auto support these different color schemes for day and night, just as you'd expect. And you want to plan for both of those color schemes in any of the design choices that you make. Now, the way it all works is pretty straightforward. You plug your phone into the car. The phone services then become available to you while you're traveling. So there's a couple of specific implementations which we've already experimented with. The media UI is an obvious one. Works really well, makes a lot of sense in the car. It's one of the primary reasons why we're plugging our devices in to begin with. So as it stands, it supports media apps such as mu music, podcasting, live radio, audio-based news, anything where it's, or, um, you're, you're listening to content, basically. Uh, your app runs as a media service that exposes the content through browsing and playback APIs so that it's the same user experience for all apps uh, on the, uh, the automotive display. So again, users aren't having to learn how to use each app. They just need to learn how to use a category of app and yours will then provide content for that uh, standard UI. Uh, Android Auto also supports a set of voice actions to interact with compatible apps and services. So again, you, you're eliminating that idea of having to interact with the screen by pressing things, by distracting your attention away from driving, which is really where you should be paying attention to. Um, which means that apps can respond to voice actions uh, that they're interested in, such as playing a song, taking a note, asking for directions, so on and so forth. So that you can hang your head out the window yeah, instead? exactly. I think that's what this no, image no, means. No, no, that's a rear vision mirror. That's the, that's the dog view, I think. Yes, that is the dog view. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's Android Auto. It's really early. I recommend you start checking out the APIs, which we announced yesterday. And so you can start thinking about how you can create an app that helps make driving even more fun. Uh, and that takes us to basically to the end of things for today. Uh, we've taken us through uh, the Lollipop Developer SDK, talked about some of the the latest platforms and opportunities that you have available. So thank you all very much. Thanks.